Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Welcome to Worship 365, for this is the day the Lord has made, and I am rejoicing, and I'm glad in it. We're doing a little bit of a lunchtime broadcast today. <laughs> Had a little um, study time this morning, and just some other amazing things that God is doing, and so um, as long as I get them done, that's all that matters. <laughs> So, Father, we just thank you. We just thank you for who you are. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our homes. And we just cry out for a moment of just saying, Father, how much we need you. We can't make it without you. We need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. Oh, God, we need you. We need you every minute, every second, every day, every hour. We need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. Hallelujah, we need you, oh, how we need you, oh, how we need you, oh, oh, we need you, we need you, oh, how we need you, oh, how we need you. Oh, we need you, oh, how we need you, yes, Lord, we need you, oh, we need you, oh, how we need you. Oh, how we need you. Oh, oh, we need you. Oh, how we need you. Oh, how we need you. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we give you all the glory that you respond to us when we cry out, Abba. 
we need you. We thank you that we can depend on and we can rely on you. Surely the Lord <laughs> is in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so um, today is day 300. And 39 uh, we are finishing strong I can just even feel um, every day the strength of the Lord rising up even within my inner man every day I feel stronger than I've ever been um, I am um, experiencing his goodness and his presence and his overwhelming joy and peace and patience even through uh, crazy situations that like to just pop up every day from time to time just to test us to see how well we're growing <laughs> that's the way i look at it it's always a test um but just to see the fruit that uh, that has been produced as a result of worshiping him in spirit and in truth every single day of my life, literally being intentional and setting aside time to spend with Abba, not just even in doing the broadcast, but literally just setting aside time to spend with him in his word and just talking to him. He is my best friend. He is my dad, you know, and it's just like we sit here and have conversations about everything. It's like, okay, so let me just talk about yesterday. Yesterday, such, such, I mean, literally, those are the kind of conversations I have with Abba. I'm just having a conversation as if he is sitting right in the room with me. Um, and he responds, you know, he responds uh, with his love or his peace or he'll lead me to his word and I'll study something amazing and he'll begin to bring revelation, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, um, or uh, one of my, you know, ministry covenant sisters will send me a text that has a, a prophetic word in it or something that they saw and God will answer the questions that I had, you know, just from that morning through that word. And I'm just seeing him show up in such amazing ways every single day day guys as a result of my undistracted devotion to him as a result of me putting him first in everything I do not just in words not just in lip service not in just in what I'm saying but actually in what I'm doing um, one of the most beautiful things that God gave me Early on in the broadcast, um, I love marketing. Marketing is one of my uh, professional backgrounds, PR, marketing, and uh, branding, and strategy. Um, and I love doing that. That's what I do professionally. But one of the most amazing things that he spoke to me in my intimate time with him is worship is not just a slow song. It's my lifestyle. And I remember when my spiritual mother first said that, that worship is not just a slow song. And I was just like, like, oh, okay, you know, it's not a slow song, you know, and then as time goes on and you develop this level of intimacy with the father, you realize that it really isn't just a slow song. <laughs> Sometimes slow songs help bring us into that place of alignment with him, but it's not just about a song. It's a posture of our heart. It's the condition of our heart. It's a lifestyle. It's a daily lifestyle. And we're being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ every single day through our dependence and our reliance on him and him alone. And so um, as a part of my study, which is why I'm doing the broadcast so late, because God had me, I mean, eating. I was eating the scroll. I'm telling you, I get in this book, y'all, and, and I just, it's hard for me to stop studying. I literally get sleepy. I just keep reading until I get sleepy and then I'll doze off for a minute, maybe 30 minutes and God will give me a dream and then I'll wake up and just start studying again because the word of God is so rich and I and it's nothing like um, opening the word of God and God beginning to give you revelation and understanding of what the word says. I remember years ago when I was younger when I got my very first life application Bible, I think I was maybe about 16 or 17 um, when I went to live with my grandmother, um, the Lord had her to buy me a life application Bible and I devoured that Bible. As a matter of fact, I don't even know where it is. I think it fell apart. Uh, it was literally in pieces um, what, the last time I saw it because I studied the word so much. But even in my teenage years from studying the word of God, even though the word was in me and my grandmother would always tell me that the word was in me and I I used to go, what does that mean? That meant that whenever I needed it, when I found myself in a crisis or 
a situation or a circumstance that the word would actually come up because the word of God is living, active and powerful. And it literally rises up in us when we need it the most. But I remember her saying that to me, even when I was a teenager, but although the word of God was in me, there were still things that I didn't fully comprehend or understand. And although the life application really helps us to understand how to apply the word of God to our personal lives, there were still things I really didn't understand. And when I was younger in my teens and my twenties, I studied the Proverbs and I studied the New Testament, but now in my 40s, actually, I think I started studying it maybe um, when I turned 38 um, and now more than ever, now that I'm 40, um, I'm studying the Old Testament. And I know a lot of people, you know, have opinions about the Old Testament, about the Old Testament being the law and we're not under the old law and we're in the new covenant because of Jesus and all that stuff, right? <laughs> and that's not what I'm here to even debate that I don't get into that kind of stuff. But what I can share with you is that there is so much revelation uh, and so much strategy that comes from Old Testament prophets. <laughs> Man, I mean, it just seems like all this year, everything that God takes me to is in the Old Testament. I mean, from Genesis to Exodus to Leviticus to Deuteronomy to Numbers, uh, I'm just like, what? I mean, you know, and now first and second Chronicles, <laughs> you know, I'm the sending of second Kings. I mean, it's just all of these things that he's been taking me to, not because he's wanting me to uh, take on um, the law, right? He's not wanting me to take on that. He's wanting me to study and understand who he is and how he works, how he spoke to his prophets, how he instructed his prophets, how their lifestyles and the decisions and the choices they made and the things they did, even the ones that made a lot of mistakes, even the, some of the kings that were just totally off the chain, you hear me? Um, just some of the things that they did that God wasn't pleased with and just really learning about the attributes of God. I learned so much about the attributes of who God is through studying Old Testament uh, prophets. And so... This morning, uh, one of my covenant sisters um, sent me uh, a link and I, I'm the kind of person, if someone sends me something that someone else wrote, I'll read it. But it's like when I start reading it, God will highlight a specific thing and then I'll stop reading it and I'll go to the Bible and I'll start to study the text for myself. And God will give me a whole new revelation just from maybe a portion of what they started speaking. And I literally never finish reading them. I have to usually go back and read them after God gives me the fresh revelation. So I was reading something this morning and God highlighted um, uh, the, the scripture in Second Chronicles. And I started to read that. But then I was like, I don't understand. The Lord said, you need to go back a couple of chapters. So I went back a couple of chapters and I started reading. And then God gave me a brand new revelation of something totally different. And I was like, wow, this is so good. So I started taking all these notes and, you know, I'm just kind of just taking notes, thinking it was going to be something that I would have the pleasure of teaching one day, because that's often what happens. Um, and then the Lord said, this is the broadcast for Worship 365 today. I was like, Ugh. Okay, you know, um, and so I was like, okay, well, help me to communicate this because this is pretty weighty. <laughs> this is pretty heavy duty stuff. Um, and so the subject title uh, today for Worship 365 is Model What You Expect. <laughs> And I just laugh. I just started laughing, right? Because I started thinking about me being a parent and me being a wife. And <laughs> so I just thinking about, you know, in my home, all the expectations that we have as parents and as spouses. And God said, I want you to begin to model what you expect, you know, in your marriage, in your, um, in your parenting, um, even in your leadership roles, the many leadership roles that, that I have given you um, in the community and in the workplace and in business and the marketplace, I want you to begin to model what you expect. And I said, well, I will do that if you teach me, <laughs> if you teach me, because uh, many of us don't know how to model something that we expect. We just uh, have only been given expectations with no modeling. Mm -hmm, now that a preach, uh, you know, people have these unrealistic expectations of you. 
but you've never been shown how to do those things or how to be those things. And so when God said that to me, I said, if you teach me, I will model what I expect. And so he took me to Second Chronicles 29. Um, and Second Chronicles 29 is all about Hezekiah. Uh, Hezekiah is another amazing uh, man of God in the Bible. And I learned some things about Hezekiah that I did not know um, and how it even relates to Worship 365. So I was like, thank you, Abba. I love you so much. Much. And so, um, let me see if he wants me to read it. Let's see, do you want me to read it? I'm going to read it. I'm just going to read uh, verses 1 through 11. Um, so just bear with me really quick. I just want to give you the text and then I will give you uh, my notes from the summation that God shared with me. And so, Hezekiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 11, and it reads, Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abraja. Abraja. I'm not really good at Hebrew names. Lord's going to have to help me with that. The daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Then he brought in the priest and the Levites and gathered them in the east square and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves, sanctify the house of the Lord of your fathers and carry out the rubbish from the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed and done evil in the eyes of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him. They have turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord and turned their backs on him. They have also shut up the doors of the vestibule and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord fell upon Judah and Jerusalem and he has gone up. He has given up, excuse me, and he has given them up to trouble, to desolation. And to jeering, as you see with your eyes, for indeed, because of this, our fathers have fallen by the sword and our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may, ma wrath may turn away from us. My sons do not be negligent now for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him to serve him and that you should minister to him and burn incense and this was this I mean there's so much rich rich word I mean there's so much rich revelation just in those 11 verses man y'all is powerful 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 stuff but just as David um, was faithful um, over Judea, so was Hezekiah. And so the backstory is um, Hezekiah's father, Azza, uh, he was the king and Hezekiah's father. He had closed the doors of the temple because he was angry with God and he was angry with the covenant of God. And so basically he completely rebelled against God and just like literally destroyed the temple. Basically, this is what happened. And um, as a matter of fact, I went back even to 30, uh, 28 and um, read how he went into the temple and began to burn incense, which is not was not his responsibility. That is a priestly responsibility. And the priests were like, what are you doing in here? It was like eight of them. They was eight deep. They walked up on him and like, you're not supposed to be in here burning incense. You know, he was trying to get the anointing, I guess. I don't know what he was doing, but, um, and he was just kind of looking at them like, you know, what do you mean? I can't be in here. I'm king. You know, I can do what I want. And then he ended up becoming leprous and he ended up dying and living in this life of isolation. And then one of his sons, his older son took over. And then um, after his son uh, took over, uh, I think he ended up resigning. And then that's where Hezekiah was risen up. So his older brother. Um, so then Hezekiah takes over. And so as soon, I mean, this right here, I was like, wow. As soon as Hezekiah, the day he began to reign over Judah, his first priority was spiritual renewal of the temple and of Judah. That was his first priority. He did not rule like his father. His brother, his older brother was just like his dad. He ruled with that iron fist, rebellious, stiff neck, all those things. But Hezekiah had a heart for God. He had, a, a, he really was the one that carried the mantle of David. 
on his life, right? Um, and and so that was his first priority. And I thought that was so powerful in that, you know, as leaders, a lot of times we find ourselves, you know, focusing on all the things that really don't matter. You know, we spend a lot of time uh, majoring on the minor when we should be majoring on the major. Um, and the major, um, as Hezekiah modeled, was spiritual renewal of Judah and spiritual renewal of um, the temple. The temple had to be rebuilt. And even throughout Old Testament scripture, it's all about rebuilding the temple. Whenever Israel got into sin, got into rebellion, got into disobedience, the temple would be destroyed and God would raise up a prophet and the prophet or the king or the man or woman of God, well, the man of God, that we don't see the women of God until Deborah, but uh, the, the men of God would be raised up to rebuild the temple and rebuild covenant and reestablish covenant. And we just see this pattern happening all throughout history. And I'm like, wow, God, this is just, and you're so patient with us and you love us so much. And we just say, can't seem to get it right. And so I think this is what God is saying to us this morning as, as leaders of our household, as leaders of our churches, of leaders of ministry, is that we have to keep the first thing first. And the first thing first is spiritual renewal and intimacy with the Father. We have to protect that above all else. And so Hezekiah wasted no time dealing with the sins of his predecessor, which was his father. So we must also, just as Hezekiah did, know and deal with our past history, the past history of the generations before our fathers, our mothers, our grandfathers, our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers, our great-grandfathers, before um, we're able to really move forward in the things of God. You know, we hear all the time, if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. And so what happens is we end up being stuck in this cycle, right? We end up being stuck in this cycle. And so a big part of my um, ministry is being a cycle breaker, a cycle breaker of abuse, a cycle breaker of uh, depression, a cycle breaker of poverty, a cycle breaker of... Um, just rebellion, you know, just rebelling against God, just going your own way. And so I had to understand and know where my mother and my father and my grandmother and my grandfather and on both sides of the family and my great grandmother and great grandfather in order to really understand what generational cycles were continuing to repeat in my life. And once I was able to identify what those things were, then I realized I've got to do something about that in my life first. And then I've got to make sure that future generations are secured. And now guess what? I have authority in those areas to teach and to minister um, life, health, health and healing to every person that I meet that might be enduring these things. And so that's what we're called to do in our households. We're called to establish a standard for living in our household. Hold on. I think my phone's about to die. Uh, we're called to establish a standard for living in our households. And many times um, we're, uh, we're, not, um, um, we're not focusing and we're not getting along with God to really understand that that's what we have to do first. We're focusing, again, we're majoring on the minor when we should be majoring on the major. And the major is always spiritual renewal and reconciliation of the body of Christ. Um, oh, and addiction. And I think I, I, when I was talking about being a cycle breaker, I left off addiction. So addiction, depression, poverty, abuse, and a rebellion. Those, those were just generational cycles that a lot of that I saw even back with the children of Israel. So it's not new to our generation. This is stuff that has been going on <laughs> since Egypt. You know what I mean? It's just crazy. Um, and so as we skip down to verses eight and nine, um, there, the, the part that reads, uh, let's see, eight and nine. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord fell upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he has given them up to trouble, to desolation, and to jeering, as you see with your eyes. For indeed, because of this, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons, our daughters, and our wives are in captivity. And so many of us are dealing with um, the loss of parents. Like I know both, both of my parents were murdered. 
both of them um, because of rebellion and disobedience and choices, right? And because of the sins of my parents, because of the mistakes and choices they made, the word of God says that their sons and their daughters and their wives will now be in a place of captivity. And so I was stuck in this place of perpetual bondage and didn't even know why. I had no clue why I was in such a place of bondage for most of my life. And it was because of the sins and the choices and the decisions of my parents. You know, and so many of us are dealing and suffering um, in, and in captivity because we've yet to really identify what the cycle is that we're stuck in. And this is what Hezekiah modeled for us in this text. Hezekiah pledged himself to lead the nation in faithfulness um, under the terms of the original um David covenant that, you know, I think they call the Davidic, the Davidic covenant. I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, the Davidic covenant is what Hezekiah made a, made an agreement to. He made a vow to God that, Hey, I'm going to pledge myself and I'm going to pledge, you know, my leadership to the Davidic covenant. And I'm going to do this thing just as you, as you've instructed God, because, you know, I noticed where the success was. I saw where the success was. And the success was not in what I saw in the generation before me. The success was not my brother and them. You know, my, this, my success, the success that I want to operate in came from the Davidic covenant. And so that's what Hezekiah did. He pledged his life um, um, to uh, the nation and to his leadership to the Davidic covenant. And this covenant ensured not only his authority, now that is the word we need. We need authority to operate in this earth today, but also the people, the people were blessed and were able to operate under God's authority because of the leadership that was established. So I, so immediately, of course, I think about the household, you know, if the household is established in the right way and the household is, is in alignment and in covenant and in agreement with God, then everything will flow, right? Everything will flow and then we'll begin to operate in authority. And then I started thinking about the church. I was like, that's what's wrong with the church. That's why there's no power and authority and no manifestations of God's power in the church because we're not living according to what God has established. Everybody is doing things according to man, according to culture. And God is like, what did I say? How should, how should these temples be really ran? You know, and so I was like, wow, God, you know, like I, you know, this, it was just really eye opening for me. And so then um, we see as we jump down to verses 15, I'm not going to read them, but I'm definitely going to give you these verses. We jump down to verses 15 through 19 and actually it goes, yeah, 15 through 19, which is a portion of the, the completion of chapter 29. We see the reconstruction of the temple was done from the inside out and it was done in 16 days. The priest and the Levites were chosen by Hezekiah to rebuild the temple and they did it in 16 days and they did it from the inside out. So they went from the most holy place, the inner court, and then they continued until it reached the outer courtyard. And that, and that was accomplished in 16 days. And then it goes on to talk about after those 16 days, there was great celebration because of what God had done. So are you ready to really get into a place where you can live every day in celebration? God is asking you today, are you willing to commit yourself to him? Are you willing to really establish a solid covenant with him and allow him to operate in you and through you the way he wants you to operate? Are you really willing to exchange your will for his will? I mean, I'm just saying there is coming a time in our lives where we have to get sick and tired of being sick and tired of seeing our families in ruin, seeing our finances in ruin, seeing our businesses in ruin, our ministries, our communities. There just comes a time where you're just like enough is enough already. Father, what what must we do? We're the answer. The kingdom of God is within us. And but but having that knowledge that the kingdom of God is within us and really operating in that level of authority are two different things. And so God is really calling us to a higher standard of living 
if we truly want to begin to see him manifest on earth as it is in heaven. If we truly want to begin to do the greater works that Jesus spoke about when he said, these works shall you do in greater. If you really want to experience that, it's really not for a select few. You know who it's for? It's for those of you, those of us who are willing to forsake all and to do things God's way and to live a life really consecrated and set apart unto him. You know, so I'm now studying about Levitical priesthood and I'm really trying to understand, you know, just what this consecrated life looks like in order to really see the manifestation of God's power and presence in our everyday life. He's been giving me a little bit of revelation and I have these daily exercises <laughs> that he takes me through to, and they're tests. They're all tests. He'll teach me something and then he'll give me an actual uh, a, an assignment to see if I'll pass the test. And if I fail it, it's like there's no condemnation, but it's like, well, Lord, what did I do differently? I didn't get the results that I wanted this time. So what do we have to do differently? And then he'll kind of like, it's like a, a, like a gentle rebuke, like next time do such and such and such and such, or next time ask me. <laughs> you know, or you didn't ask me, you know, you know, he'll just say little things like that. Uh, next time, make sure you do X, Y, Z first or whatever. And I believe that's the same thing he's telling us to do in our homes and in our families and our communities and our churches. It's a very beautiful exchange because he wants to see us win. He wants to see us finish strong. And he's given us everything we need according to life and godliness in this word. If we just sit down and read it, if we just sit down and just digest it and ask the Holy Spirit to begin to reveal, if we just begin to lay hands on our will and just say, Holy Spirit, activate me afresh so that I'm able to discern the word, the living word of God, so that I'm able to know how to apply it to my life and then know how to live it out every day. There is a serious disconnect between the preach word that we hear and this life application. And I'm here to tell you that over the last 300, what's this day? I can never keep up with these days. Over the last 335 day, 39 days, I have seen so much transformation in my personal life in terms of just not understanding the word and hearing the word, but literally living the word, allowing the word of God to become living, powerful and active in my life. So that I walk in the place uh, that I need to walk in every single day so that I'm effective, so that I'm not bound by depression or addiction or sickness or fear or any of the stuff that keeps us bound. All of that stuff is, is, is a result of, of disobedience and sin nature. All of it. You know, the exchange, the exchange is a fruitful life. The fruit of the spirit. The Bible says that if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the word of God is not a lie. So either we're wrong or the word of God is wrong. And you know what? The word of God is not wrong. And so I've put the word of God to the test. I've put the word of God to the test for 339 days. I've put worship to the test for 339 days. I've put intimacy with the father to the test for 339 days. And you know what it equals? Results, baby. It equals results. And I'm telling you, if you will just continue to dial in, dig in, get connected, talk to Abba, develop intimacy with him like never before, he will totally transform your life and eventually you will begin to see the outpouring of that fruit in the lives of other people. I believe it, I know it, I feel it, and I'm so excited that many of you have taken this journey with me and I just look forward to 2019. I don't know how Worship 365 is gonna look for 2019. I know we're still gonna do it, but I don't know how it's gonna look. And so I just encourage you to stay connected continue to invite, continue to share, continue to watch the replays, go back. I told you, if you if you haven't seen any of these broadcasts from day one, go to my Twitter, at Chai Like the Tea. And you can go all the way back to day one. Day one, January 1st, 2018 was day one. And there has been such, there's been physical transformation. There's been healing in my body. There's been mental and emotional transformation. There's been financial increase. There's been just this harvest, this abundance as a result of me just choosing to really put him first in every area of my life through his word, studying his word, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And I'm telling you, he is no respecter of person. If he did it for me, he will surely do it for you. 
And so I love you guys. With the love of the Lord, I want to see everybody win. I want to see you win. I do, I do, I do. Because the more of us that are winning, the more we will begin to see the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And the more we can begin to take these mountains, these seven mountains for the kingdom of God. And so... I love you guys so much. I thank you. Sorry, it's been a, it was a little longer broadcast than normal, but I just really had this stirring in my belly that the Lord was like, go, 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 go. I was like, yes, 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 you know. Um, and so hopefully it blessed you today. Again, please be sure to invite. Please be um, sure to share it. And Lord willing, I'll see you right back here tomorrow with some Rama. <laughs> I love you guys with the love of the Lord. Thank you. Many blessings to you. I try not to read the text, the messages when I'm teaching because I get a little distracted and I get to talking to y'all and then I'll never get through the message. But thank you guys for watching. Thank you for tuning in. Continue to invite, continue to share. And I love you with the love of the Lord and Lord willing, I'll see you right back here tomorrow for Worship 365. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.